You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast. And, um, well, she knows it already. I'm super excited to have Hannah Walker Brown uh, on, on this episode. Before I spend a little bit of time, Hannah, talking about what you do, uh, mm-hmm. just want to say hi right off hi. the bat. <laughs> hi. I, I feel there's a little. What, what I wanted to let folks know um, what you do, as you know, Hannah, I'm a, a big fan of your work. Uh, Hannah Walker Brown's. Um, uh, based in London, she's a, a podcast a producer, uh, author, creative director. Um, she works with uh, Broccoli Productions in producing high quality, fantastic uh, podcast content. My favorite being Zombie Mum uh, of 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 those. Great. And well. um, and uh, uh, I first encountered Hannah with um, uh, basically it was an Audible. Uh, uh, present presentation of uh, a f- uh, four part short series called the beautiful brain, which dealt with um, a CT uh, brain injury uh, in particular there uh, around uh, British uh, football, soccer. <laughs> and, um, and also uh, I, I would be remiss in not mentioning the fantastic uh, anthems uh, content um, that, that have been produced that we, we could chat a bit about. All right. So Hannah, you've done a lot of stuff. I'm really interested in, stuff, in, yeah. in, 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 in your work. Um, we'll talk more about that, but we got to go back to the beginning. And, and I'm wondering when you were born, Hannah, were you, were you an artist when you were born? You know, I was thinking about this question um, because I don't know if I would even class myself as an artist now, but I think I was born a fighter. I think that has always been in me. And this is ridiculous, but sort of a crisis point in my late teens, I did go and see a shaman, which in London, um, which, you know, deduce from that what you will. But um, he knew instantly that I was put into an incubator the moment I was born. So I sort of came into the world fighting for my life, I suppose. Um, And I don't know how much, you know, people take from that or read into that or how much kind of you think that is grounded in truth or reality. But I think I've always had that fight. And I say a lot, you know, I'm as much inspired by rage as I am by hope. And I think that fighting spirit is something intrinsic in anything I do, whether it's kind of music I make or the podcasts I produce or now the books that I'm writing I think that fight has always been there so I think I was born with that which has ultimately propelled me forwards and I guess how I chose to express that or the way I choose to kind of I guess tap into that is through my art I'm doing kind of inverted commas with my fingertips because you know, documentary and storytelling, I suppose, in my MO, but the way that I tell those stories and how I craft these things is very artistic. Um, but I'd say I was born a fighter and I've just fueled that into whatever I've made. And it just kind of made sense for me to have a creative outlet for that rather than, I don't know, politics or something where, mm-hmm. you know, people are shouting at you all the time and, you know, you have to be right. I guess I needed something to explore and, and evolve with and art felt like the space to do that or, or creative expression and artistic creative expression felt like the place to do that, to harness yeah. that, I suppose. Yeah, I, well, I like to... You know, where you're born a fighter, I'm sure that's a good question to plop in there in there too. And I mean, I obviously with your your work, it's 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 noticeable because you have to go all in. And and I, I've heard some of your description as far as uh sound, and it's been very helpful talking about the human voice. And I've mm-hmm. I've 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 um talked to guests uh, about that and about podcasts and how it raises the voice and what you hear. And you talk about the different components of, mm. um, uh, of that, but I would say on your, on, on the creation of art, I mean, your fighting is right in there because in order to get like an investigative story, in order for you to go into 
gosh, football, male football, <laughs> and money, and start saying that people are getting hurt and start to mention it. You know, there's only <laughs> the fighting has to be the way that you, you get to your art. Yeah, absolutely. Like you have to be tenacious, which I have in abundance. Like you have to graft. Um, and also courage, I think, like, you know, courage has always been one of my three values and I try and live my life by that. And it was something my grandma said to me shortly before she died um, about being brave and, and never settling. And she didn't mean like, you know, don't settle for the wrong romantic partner, but it was just settle in anything, you know, have the courage to 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 want more, to be more, to do more than even you think you're capable of. And that wasn't in a kind of, you know, capitalist way. Like, I deserve loads of money. But it was like, you know, I realized quite early on, I do have a responsibility because I have this ability to be able to go into those spaces. I have access to these stories and therefore I should tell them. And that does require courage on my part. You know, like you said, with the book I've just written, you're confronting sporting bodies. I, I'm going for them. <laughs> you can't be sort of on the fence about that. You're either all in or, or not. And and that courage, I think, and that fight is is definitely what drives the art. And also, you know, I, I want to do this. I get great enjoyment out of doing it. I'm not here, you know, because I don't want to be here. I have and I have to be like, I really enjoy being able to meet so many people, being able to kind of be the container into which those stories can live. And, and you know, the responsibility, I guess, is I'm told them and then I tell them to you, the listener, the world. And and that's the kind of the great responsibility is telling that in an authentic way, being truthful to them. Um, but, yeah, it requires yeah tenacity and, and courage and and a bit of fight. And I don't mean you're fighting against people, but... You know, you're fighting to get where you are. I fought to get into the industry. It's really hard. Like I'm from a working class background. You know, doors aren't open for us. We have to kick those doors down. You know, also I'm a woman. And predominantly, you know, I started in radio and that was predominantly in production. Companies were run by men. All commissioners at the BBC are white men. So, you know, even from the get go, before you've even got to the story, there's a fight to be had. Um, so you have to be tenacious, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I know in the stories that, you know, the stories that, that you go in and I, and I, I recognize, I mean, I hear the voice you had some of the, you know, um, East London uh, gang. I heard the, 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 just hearing the voices of those folks, I mean, change the accent a bit. These are kids that I grew up. This is, this is the area mm -hmm. that, that I grew up. And uh, one of the, one of the pieces I just want to share with the audience that I, that I found, which was, I'd seen a YouTube video where you, you presented the, the voices of, of, um, of, of these uh, individuals. And afterwards, the sound craft that he had into it, I felt like it still had everybody wrapped in there. Like, so I, there was this cohesion between the sound and it was just like, I'm bringing you along. So mm -hmm. um, I see so much of the creative pieces that you do with, with, with sound and I kind of attach to them and, and, and learn from them. So uh, thank you for that and, and doing that, but I got another, let's kick back, back to the conceptual before we get, uh, <laughs> I, I want to know, I want to know, um, uh, I want to know what you believe art is. And I know you were kind of like, a, you felt like a little bit, squirrely on the podcast <laughs> art creative. Go, go 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 into it what yeah what is what is art do you know what though I think the thing is I what I do I think is art I think podcasts now have become especially in the UK just to kind of they're more marketing than anything else like they're to get um money they're to put celebrities um front and center so like the craft which I'm not precious about because I think, you know, things have to evolve and we have to evolve with them. But I guess podcast is the term that I scroll at because it, it's just, it to me, what I do and, and what I hope my work does feels more than what that is, which at the moment is kind of just heavy marketing. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I really, I'm really glad that, you know, you mentioned the sound because that's so important to me and my work. And I think, if we're talking about art, for me, 
It's the ability to take someone away from their everyday. That's what art does. That's what it has the potential to do. And I guess it, it is a kind of a conversation, between, whether it's kind of a painting, whether it's an audio piece, whether it's a film, like there's a dialogue between you as the viewer, listener, and whatever the piece is, you know, you have a response. It's, you know, the art doesn't live unless it's given to an audience because that's kind of when it comes to life is when it ignites something in your imagination or it sparks a conversation yeah. or, uh, you know, people are repelled by it even. Like there there has to be that response. And, and I found with sound very, very early on in my life that sound could have a really visceral reaction in people. It could really take you somewhere else. And... And, you know, we see it with songs and kind of the emotional response or, you know, you hear the beat of a particular song and you're right back to when you were 15 in that car, you know, I don't know, smoking a joint, whatever we were doing when we were 15. Yeah, and yeah. it's instant, like it's that transportation is instant. And I think for me, I just love that hit, like that hit of, uh, I, I don't know, just being elsewhere. And I, I found, you know, I really like art. I'm really into um kind of contemporary art but that takes a little bit more time like when you're observing a piece or you're like reading about the artist where a sound I found like instantly you can go somewhere done well it can take yeah. you away and you don't even know where you've been until it's finished and you've kind of landed back in the room and that's what I wanted to do and and I I'm at my happiest when I'm making those pieces like I can lose hours days sometimes I'm sort of in the middle of something at the moment where I've just started to do the music and the sound yeah. around the the voice around the story and I don't know I just sort of lose myself a bit so it's that that transportative quality of art yeah. I love that's yeah. what I think art is yeah, I, I, I wanted to, uh, and I just wanted to mention sound, I have a big term, but but sound. Um, and, you know, I mentioned how I was able to pick up and, and just understand creation more about what you're doing and the power of that and you describing the human voice. Mm -hmm. I've had those conversations as well. And also with music, like I've learned to hear music better from my yeah. son, who's a, a musician and describes it to me. And other people around me say, hey, Ken, listen to here it is right here and so i'd gone for a long time not really understanding how sound was impacting me and mm -hmm. now doing a podcast and be like ken you gotta figure out what is happening <laughs> with 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 sound because yeah, the power as you identify yeah yeah and it's really interesting when you think about listening and actually the power of listening, and I mean like listening in its purest sense, like really listening. And you find this in interviewing people as well, because I'm not there to reply. I'm not there to kind of input anything of my own. I'm, I'm just there to listen to this person's story and hold that space for them to tell it. And I, you know, I don't really know many occasions where anyone is really just there to listen to you. Like, even if it's kind of, a doctor they're still thinking about their next patient that's coming in in 15 minutes because you know they've got such a high turnaround but to have someone actually there for a, you know this kind of extended length of time usually and actually listen to what you have to say I think there's like real power in that so it does work both ways and yeah it's interesting the amount of people that don't actually listen to music I was having this conversation the other day with one of our producers about now because of you know the new kind of monopoly of digital spaces like TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat music is just kind of there to be consumed like it's quickly consumed it's shared it's gone and we were talking about how you know you'd buy an album and you'd order it and it would arrive and then you'd sit there and listen to it from start to finish or I used to play them in the car when I was a teenager and you know be driving around listening to every track and you know that now it's it's like you know 10 second burst of a song that's it and then it kind of that I don't know it and it's fine it's fine that that's how it changes you know I'm sure if I had a conversation with my dad about music he'd be like oh you lot ruined it whereas we're now looking at kind of the next generation like what are you doing but <laughs> that kind of art of listening I think has yeah has been lost somewhere 
Right. It's like the, uh, well, I think there's something there too. I mean, if you just mention, you know, an album, right. It, you know, you know, a subpar track on side B of your yeah. favorite album that you just, you sit through and be like, well, the next one's great. So I'll sit through the three and a half minutes of this song that I'm marginal about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But now it's like, no skip. Like people are even, which I just, it blows my mind, but People listen to audiobooks and even Netflix, they watch it on double speed or they listen on double speed because they want to get all the information, but they don't want to spend the time. And I'm like, this, the world is mad, which, you know, we well know, but just like that consumption, like everything is just on overdrive, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, well, in well, going back to storytelling and the, mm. the human voice, it's, it sounds uh, foundational. But what I want to I want to take you know us talking about um, art and what art is. I want to ask mm. another important question that probably you think about in terms of your work. Um, I've asked guests over time, and the question sounds different during a pandemic. Is what is the role of art? All right, so we have art pieces like. What is it supposed to be doing? Is it doing that? Like, what is the role of art for us humans? Hmm. I mean, I think there's so many answers for this. I think my my response is probably still grounded in that escape and that departure from the ordinary. And for me art is to affect change it's a tool for resistance and rebellion but I think like that yeah that departure from reality I think is the biggest thing for me which is what I have always got in my kind of mind when I'm making something I think I don't know it's I always see it as this duality, like it's not kind of, you know, it's not just about the artist, but it's also the, again, the listener, the viewer, um, the consumer, I suppose, if we want to kind of go there. And it, there has to be an exchange between the two. So for me, it, it still feels as something quite inclusive, which I know kind of art, if you look at it kind of in the art world is renowned for being, you know, the exclusive scene, but I think real art for it to be of any value for it to have any response, it has to be, you know, you give and, and receive between whoever's kind of taking it on. But yeah, I think it's definitely the means for change. I think we can make the world better with art. I hope. Yeah. I think we used right. It really can impact and empower. Um, and I mean, I want to change the world. Like that's always been my MO, even in a small way. So anything where I am expressing myself creatively will have that kind of behind it. But I definitely think it is that to... I guess to, to take someone away and that doesn't have to be just into the lives of someone else. That could be for like a moment of beauty or a moment of clarity or a moment of calm or a moment of joy, but just something that, that offers the extraordinary or the extraordinary. So like an extra to your ordinary, it doesn't have to be kind of fantastical and mythical and, you know, Harry yeah. Potter and broomsticks, but just something, something else, I think. And within yeah. those spaces, that's where change occurs or where clarity or, you know, inspiration hits. So I guess, yeah, it's quite rambly. I'm kind of thinking about no, it as I'm no, going. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm, 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 I'm thinking with you. I want to ask a different uh, type of question connected yeah. to this. So you talked about, um, you talked about uh, kind of, um, you know, art uh, having this piece of, you know, it's something different. It's it's something uh, escape or release. Not totally. I'm that wasn't mm. the nature of comments, but like you go there for it. But I see I see your dynamic is 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 it's complicated because you're the artist creating this type of thing, and so me as the consumer, I can listen to your intimate uh, conversation and I can glean all those things from it. But I'm fascinated by the fact that you go in and talk 
to folks in a particular way. And that what I mean by that is that you create this connection, this human connection, and you talk about the physicality of it mm. when it's physically happening. You're a fighter. You're going in and getting these stories. You're the artist doing that. Mm. What you create seems to be that separation. I can listen to it over here in Oregon and be like, what a human story. Like I'm mm -hmm. moved, like I'm interested in this person. You as the artist, you're going in there in, in, in the connection. How are you able to do that for yourself as an artist? How do you, how am I able to, hmm. I mean, can I swear or would you rather I didn't? I was... You can, I, as a matter of fact, uh, Hannah, I've listened to you before. I, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting it. If you listened to me before, we would have had this tacit understanding I that, fuck, fuck yeah, go ahead. I know. Do you know what? I'm trying to be on my best behavior because I, I do no, swear a lot. This is so. not a best behavior. I'm not connected to anybody. I'm a union rep in the United States. I, I love know. your work. It's just good practice, though, isn't it? I'm like, oh, God. Um, no, I was going to say, you know, in any of these situations, I have to empty out of my own bullshit. I, I, again, and this is where I trained to be a yoga teacher, which actually came much later, but the two do really kind of complement each other in terms of how you go into a space with someone, how you hold that space with someone and how you make that safe. Because yes, I'm going in, I'm leaving everything that I have behind sort of just you literally just empty out of whatever you're going through that day, whatever kind of preconceptions you might have. I don't even go in with questions. I make sure I kind of really study up on the person and what I want from them. But I don't go in with like a piece of paper, for example, because that creates like an instant barrier between me and them, you know. So I'm just going in as me, Hannah, the human. Like, yes, I'm going to kind of draw this story out or we're going to have this conversation but I'm never in as like I'm a producer and this is what I'm getting and I think that's what people kind of forget like human first right if you're human first then someone is at ease there's various things I do to ensure that kind of that space is really safe and that they feel held and and like I said like you know I'm there to listen so I make sure that that's what I'm doing. You know, I've got nothing else. Like my phone is off. I'm not kind of, you know, looking around outside. Like I'm, I'm there for you. And I think, again, that's very rare. And it's very precious, I think, to, to have that encounter with someone. And if someone's agreed to speak to you, it's because they want to. You know, it's not because you kind of force them or a lot of people, if they say no, I'd never push it. Because what's the point of that? You're just going to get a really like uncomfortable situation. The story's not going to be great. There's going to be this kind of tension, I suppose. So if they've agreed to speak to me, then I know that they're kind of up for it. Yeah. And I guess within that, it's just, again, making someone feel comfortable. But also, you know, they know what I'm there for as well. So there isn't yeah. kind of any surprises. And and I've always said, like, the way I make work is show and don't tell. Like, I don't want to tell the listener, the audience, what someone's feeling or what I think. I'm just going to show you what happened within that space and and relay it as authentically and truthfully as I can. And when I say truthfully, I don't mean, like, you know, the cold hard facts I mean the truth of how I felt in that situation the truth of what that encounter was like and whatever you feel within the sound design of my work or within the work itself I use the sound to explain to you how I was feeling so whatever you feel from that encounter from that piece that's how I'm using the sound and when I come to kind of editing those stories and whatever that's where my expression is so you, I, you won't hear from me very often at all in my work apart from beautiful brain which obviously narrated but I bleed through all of the sound so any moments of emotion or anything that really kind of hits you like guaranteed I was hit in that moment that's why that's kind of been elevated so for me I just love I love that 
conversation I love that space uh, and it's the same thing I got from teaching yoga you are there whatever your students need that's what you give them and you have to make sure that they're safe that they're practicing you know they're not pushing themselves because of ego that you know they're working within their parameters that they feel like they're getting what they need that day out of it you know if they've got high energy give them high energy if they they really need to come down you settle them down but it's like, you know, I couldn't go into a yoga class. Everyone's like, oh, I'm so tired from work. And I'm like, no, we're going to work hard. Like that's that's just, you know, instantly creates a kind of disconnect. Whereas, yeah. okay, I see you. Let's let's nurture that space. So I buzz. that's why I do this. Like I buzz on that yeah. face-to-face encounter. Yeah. And I don't know how to explain it. It's just you're you know, not just kind of listening to someone, but them entrusting me with that story, like letting me in, right? That's a privilege. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's that 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 connection that's there because I see it as, as the root for the art that comes out, but like mm. always appreciating that you're a person and a human in, the, in, in that process. Yeah. And hearing about you, you, yoga, I was just thinking along the same type of thing around whatever the magic or the energy or the movement that's there, um, I think it's kind of like when you you don't think necessarily of like interviewing documentaries, yoga, but there's this mind and body piece that, you know. Yeah, and it totally. And they are so I've l- taken so much from interviewing for docs into my yoga and vice versa. And I do think like they seem so far apart, but essentially like you you're holding space for another human being into which they can be vulnerable where it is safe to be vulnerable. That's what a yoga class is, right? You know, you get the most out of your practice if you're willing to like let go of your ego and just be like, you know what? I'm just going to do this and whatever comes, comes. If you're like, no, I'm going to be strong and I'm going to do this and I'm not going to, you know, you, you're not going to get the most out of your practice. The same way if you go into an interview and someone's like, no, I don't want to say that. I want to keep this. You know what I mean? Like it's the yeah. same and both yeah. are shitty outcomes. Whereas right. Right. if you take the layers off right in both you get the most out of it as as uh, interviewer and interviewee as teacher and student and they they do run in parallel and it blew my mind when I started teaching yoga I was like oh I know how to hold this space because I've been doing it for all these years in a different scenario but essentially the foundations are exactly the same wasn't and that just blew my so I was I had a similar not a similar but like a different type of analogy so I I work as a union rep for 21 years and then I I'm doing the podcasting thing and I'm like you know there's nerves around it and I'm like how did I end up talking to like <laughs> this metal band in Brooklyn I just part of my personality but one of the things I realized would be like working as a union rep I have 21 years of not choosing the conversation I have mm. Number two, people coming to me, me setting up that space for them mm-hmm. and them telling me about their affair or their mental illness or alcohol or great students in their class or any human experience possible. And I've been like, Ken, you've done this for a little while where whatever it is that's going on, you're going to get into it. But I didn't, I didn't even like notice that skill of Mm. work over here being like, that's why you can chat with kind of with a greater ease than others. But I know, I think it is. It's like, I think we're so, because of, you know, the way the world is and, you know, the kind of climbing the career ladder and this desire to succeed, we're always so focused on the job title. Like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that because I've never been a, presenter I couldn't possibly do that because I've never been a producer and actually like what we need to keep remembering in this is these are kind of fundamental human skills that we can apply to these things you know you can learn how to edit a a podcast right you can learn how to use software what you can't learn is I mean maybe you can but if you can't have a conversation with someone and you can't hold space then it doesn't matter because your podcast is going to be shit right it's going to be terrible you can edit it within an inch of its life it's going to have no heart so that's the stuff we really need to work on before the the titles the job description stuff yeah because yeah. i think you really they, you can apply it to so many things counselor I, podcast producer union rep like yoga teacher 
Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. I think, uh, I mean, I, here's an example of it for me, you know, just, yeah. just, just not noticing what's going on there and, and using that as a sense of empowerment, you know, yeah. like, like I know how to do this. Yeah. It's a little bit of a tweak, but give me three days and I got this shit down. Right? Yeah. And, and you only get better. Like the more you do, the better you get. It's yeah. like, like with anything, I think that's something else we've forgotten. Like, Oh, if you just keep doing it, you know, yeah. keep well, practicing. Uh, one of the things, hey, Hannah, I wanted to ask too, because I'm, mm. um, you know, get into creative process and, um, but you also done something very distinct creatively, and that is to write a book called mm. A Delicate Game. Mm. Um, as far as like bouncing over there, as far as like creating and, and do, what the heck was that like for you? I mean, obviously, you know, the the stories the stories you know were there you've been around that type of content but now you go in to write a book that's uh, a completely different endeavor creatively uh, how's that well, like what was that experience um it was really hard <laughs> it was the hardest thing i i mean i'm not hardest thing i've ever done as in you know there's hardships in life but as in creatively it was it was really difficult and you know also I wrote it during the first year of the pandemic so not an ideal you know I always thought I'd write my first book like on a Greek island and yeah. <laughs> everything would be you know I don't know bohemian and I'd, I don't know, it would just be amazing. Write it in the Mediterranean area somewhere. <laughs> yeah well I mean and I did I wrote it for three months in Spain um after the first lockdown, I just had to get out of London because it was hell. Um, I was like, fuck it, I'll go to Spain to do this. But then Spain had a lockdown. <laughs> and then I came back and then I went back. And then, I don't know, it just wasn't the year to be taking on something you've never done before. <laughs> and I think the thing that I could never have imagined is how vulnerable it makes you feel to be writing something like putting your own words onto a page was like someone had taken all my clothes off me and I was just kind of stood there naked in the middle of like Trafalgar Square or somewhere just yeah. uh, with loads of people and I just I didn't expect that at all um and you know they're not my stories like you said I've been doing this for six years this from the back of the beautiful brain um about the CTE and sport and corruption. Um, so it's kind of an extension of all those stories and, and across all sport actually now, AFL, NFL, rugby, um, soccer, also um, domestic hockey, violence. Hockey, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not even like I'm writing a memoir where I'm telling you like the deepest, darkest depths of my life, but right. there was something so like, like, I would I was paralyzed with anxiety at points writing this because and I, I don't know whether it was because I hadn't done it before and I didn't have I, I didn't know how to do it and I know it sounds really strange because I've written a lot and I've written audio books but this is a whole different ball game um but there was just something about the vulnerability and I think also within that time I got diagnosed with ADHD so I was kind of <laughs> wondering why I couldn't this thing was so hard to do I was procrastinating non-stop I was feeling really vulnerable we were in a pandemic um and I know when it comes out in March I'm going to be like oh it's so great <laughs> but it was it was really really hard and I think you know I'm I'm launching a new blog in at the end of this month where I'm going to talk a lot more about you know the creative process behind that because I think especially with kind of Instagram, you know, all we see is like, hey, I've written a book and, you know, an author in front of a perfectly curated bookcase. Like, I want all the pain book. and suffering. Where's the pain yeah, and suffering? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> why does no one talk about the pain? And actually authors I've spoken to, I had one author, me and her were had the same agent. So we were talking, both writing our first books at the same time. So I mean, God forbid those voice notes we sent each other should ever come out because they are just like, this is so shit. <laughs> um, but then you speak to authors privately and they're like, oh, yeah, it's awful. It's uh, Writing a book is horrendous. But then the kind of front and, and what everyone else sees is just kind of the shiny stuff. But then I realized 
once it's out and you're holding it, it is so shiny that you almost forget the trauma. And I've got to write another book after this one. Like, I'm on a two book deal. So. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but I guess the thing is, it was, it was challenging in the sense that, you know, I've spent 12 years making audio, doing sound, like I can do it like, you know, it's back of my hand stuff, you know, and, and I still really enjoy it, but this was kind of a whole new endeavor. And I'm grateful that it was how it was in some ways, because it re I really had to like step up and sharpen up and confront a lot of things as well. Like, was I scared of it being not good enough? Was I scared of people buying it? Did I think you know, I, I guess in my head, I really wanted to make the leap from sound to writing in the next few years and kind of have a little career shift. And I was basically just piling all this pressure on myself when actually I just needed to write. That was it. Yeah. So it definitely taught me a lot about process. Um, and it's finished. <laughs> so yeah. did the <laughs> so process, that's okay. Did the, did the, uh, this is just a curious question. Did the process of, of, of writing and coming out of that, I've written not to the extent you know, that, that you're talking about writing. Um, did you notice changes in, in, in your brain after that experience of like that type of like writing or trying to shift the writing to lend the voice via words? Um, yes. Uh, I think actually, interestingly, I approached it in the same way that I would do a documentary even though there is more of an element of tell because you, the one thing that's really obvious, I mean, it's so obvious, but um, you can't hear the tone of someone's voice on paper that like I have to create around that rather than being like, you know, they sounded angry. Like how yeah. can I build that show and don't tell yeah. Yeah. into words on paper, which <laughs> I do think I, I managed. I mean, we'll see when it comes out. <laughs> But I think it was about, again, creating that environment. And this was very different because I've done all the interviews. Now you've got to hold space for the reader. Yeah. I have to contain all of this stuff. So they have all the information. They have all the scientific facts. They have the kind of the intimacy and emotion of me being in the room with these people. And I have to do that in a way that not only makes sense, but it's also hopefully interesting to read, you know, and and that was the challenge, I think. And again, you know, because when you're listening to something, you know, the human voice betrays so much, you know, even this very simple, like, you know, you ask someone if they're OK, I'm fine. Their voice instantly tells you yeah. they're not fine. Yeah. Whereas on the page, like, how do I communicate that? How do I ensure that I'm getting that level of kind of uh, capturing it or yeah capturing it but how and communicating it in in the most authentic way and that i found challenging on page yeah yeah um, I'm, I'm i'm i mean i'm deeply you know in, in my my personal approach to your book is you know obviously i'm like deeply interested in read it, but it's actually to the point of your mind applied to this issue. That's yeah. like for, 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 for me, just in seeing how you do your work. So, um, so uh, really, really, really looking forward to that. Uh, back to the conceptual question rather than the agony and horror of writing. <laughs> oh, I know it's not really like, I know it, there were moments no. of joy moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your, your second book I know is the joy of writing. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the second, uh, the second one. Um, uh, this, this is uh, a big question. A couple more. Uh, big question is who or what made you who you are in a Walker Brown? Oh my God. So many people and so many things. And I think that's, you know, you have to be insatiably curious to do what I do. Like you, you have to be. Um, and so my friends always find it hilarious. And my dad has mentioned this since I was a kid, but I'll talk to anyone and they find me <laughs> like I will be you know outside a pub in the pouring rain and I'll be having a conversation or I'm the person people sit next to on the bus 
and they want to chat like and I don't know I've just always had a lot of time for everybody I remember me and my dad he's got um, a little cottage in the north of England a seaside town and the pub it's maybe like 50 people there in the whole place and there was you know, one night we went to the pub and there was three people in there me him and this other person who was at the bar by the end I was sat basically interviewing this person at the bar about their life and I just think <laughs> I don't know it's just something I've always had in me and I think being around a lot of um my parents separated when I was very young but both had big groups of friends so we always were around a lot of adults. There was always a lot of people around. Like we were very sociable. Like that were kind of the networks we were brought up into, um, like working class. But I think, you know, a lot of the time that's misinterpreted as not being cultured. Like my dad's a musician. We had a lot of theatre, a lot of art. We, you know, not a lot of money, but the kind of the things that enriched me as a person were kind of there in abundance. So, again, I just people I think people are the things that have made me who I am and and actually again like this idea of courage like having the courage to 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 go deep like to really sit with myself I think has been integral like that very deep self-inquiry like acknowledging and, and working with the the stuff I don't like about myself or the stuff that makes me angry and actually rather than kind of pushing it away or pretending it's not there, I've got very good at really tuning into that and questioning that and and embracing both sides. And and I think that's really enabled me to really be myself without shame or, you know, without trying to be someone I'm not. And that's something that I think Sony really come into play for me in the last kind of three years since I've been in my 30s. But I think this is when I've really stepped into myself. But people, yeah. I would say. Yeah, yeah. And 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 thank you. Thank you for that. Um I have one question before the big, you know, why is there something rather than nothing uh question, which everybody, you know, just kind of crumbles or yells at me about. But that one's <laughs> tough. Don't worry about that, Hannah. That um do you, uh, this is particular, some of the things you said, um, mm. it, you get a curious mind. I have a curious mind, deeply interested in a lot of things. Some might say too, too, too many things. I don't know what the limits are. Never. How do you, how do, you do, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you end up directing? You're curious. You talk to a lot of people, you learn a lot of things. How does that uh, end up? Uh, how do you end up, you know, working the flow of what you're going to create out of all that? How do you, how do you figure that out? Or is that the problem? Yeah, it's a problem. That's why I'm always doing too many things at the same time. Um, for me, it's those things that you can't forget. And I, or there's a quote I heard once that you haven't thought about it right if you haven't thought about it twice. And I think it's those things that you that just, they're there. And I have a feeling sometimes, like I had a feeling beautiful brain was not something I would have been interested in in terms of I really liked sport documentaries but I hadn't ever made one I'd I'd made a science podcast but I'd never been interested in it in at that level but it was meeting Dawn one of the contributors and I knew in that moment the second I met her I had to tell her story so that might come first for example rather than I'm going to do something about dementia in sport it was like I've met this person her story what is this story and then it just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows um so it's those things that they just grab me or I wake up thinking about it like with anthems I had the idea and I wrote it as a um note on my note app on my phone and then over Christmas I was like finessing it and I knew because I was supposed to be on time off over Christmas but I just had this thing going around and then as soon as we came back to work on January 2nd I was like I've got this idea and we made it straight away so I think it's just those things that I can't let go of and you know there's things that are really important to me like um raising women's voices you know dismantling <laughs> patriarchy um yeah. and you know I guess miscarriages of justice 
are sort of where I sit. You know, I want things that I make to have a social impact. Um, so that does sort of narrow it down a little. But yeah, now I've sort of, I hone in on the things that I really want to do. And I'm very lucky that I can just make my work. I very rarely do someone else's project. I've just taken on a music project, though, um, commissioned to make music for someone else's documentary. But that's about as far as I'll go now. Any documentary ideas or, or I guess, written ideas are all mine now. Yeah. Which is, you know, an, an amazing place to be in my career. You know, you don't have to make other people's stuff. But then it means I'm authentically invested. I don't have to kind of pull that from from a different source, you know, like my heart's in it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, just hearing you uh, fight you know, fight for that space that is mm. so vital. I mean, you talked about the environment, um, you know, that exists. And I think anything that we present uh, creatively and in, in who it represents, you know, is, is just, is just, is just vital. I've learned yeah. so much by simply talking to folks and I've been astounded at the level of my ignorance, mm -hmm. master's degrees. I'm a smart guy. People say you're a smart guy. I do all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I was, you know, just dumbfounded by like, holy shit, you didn't know anything about yeah. that. And you thought you did. And, yeah. um, you know, the tripping, tripping aggressively is, is yeah, helpful. Yeah. Is helpful. It totally <laughs> is. And, you know, that you, you know, there's this kind of idea, especially in the UK, that you can kind of pick and choose what parts of like equality you want or what parts of diversity you want. And it's like, it's very simple. You either believe in it or you don't. You're either in or you're out. There's no like, yeah. I'll take a little bit of this and a bit of this, but you can keep that bit. It's like, no. And yes, that's really hard. No one said it was easy. And you have to really train yourself. So every decision you make is, again, founded in who am I representing? Am I the best person to tell this story? What's missing? I ask myself that all the time. Anytime we put anything out as broccoli, those are the questions we ask. And are we always going to get it right? No, we're not. But do we always try? Absolutely. And we'll keep going until, you know, now I feel like it's second nature. It wasn't in the beginning. You know, you have to kind of constantly, like you said, trip, interrogate, speak. You know, you can't do everything by yourself either, which is a misconception as well. But um, yeah, that's essential because... I do have this massive position of privilege in that I get to decide what goes out on a platform that's listened to by millions of people. So right. I want to make sure that I'm serving the people that, you know, need to be served that or that currently aren't being served by the content that's being made or um, the voices that are being heard. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, that's, that's always been our MO at Broccoli and, and we were hoping other people would follow suit, but that remains to be seen. But we're still going to do it because, yeah. that, that, and also we want to do it. It's not like someone said, you know, you have to be diverse. It's like, we want to do that. Like, that's always been what we wanted to do. Um, so, but again, I, I think people, it's not easy, but right. nothing good ever is, right? Right. Well, uh, uh, Hannah, I have, um, I have, a, a a particular, a particular question, uh, which is the something rather than nothing question. I'll, I'll, I'll pose it, but I, I have the sense I could be a little bit cheeky with you. I know the answer to why there's <laughs> something rather than nothing. And I don't think I've announced it on the show, although it's been said before. And because, because, because of, uh, uh being from, uh, you know, the London area, uh, Douglas Adams of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mm -hmm. already gave humanity the answer to the question of why is there something rather than nothing? Why is any? It's the number 42. So I know from the, the that that's already out there. OK, but um, for you, Hannah, if, if that isn't the right answer, the number 42, uh, why, why is there something rather than nothing? I don't. Oh, do you know what? I was like, oh, God, how am I even going to answer this? You could say 42. I gave you an out. <laughs> no, no. I was like, oh, how can I be really profound and like throw it back at you? But um... 
Oh, why is and that? I've been nervous about you throwing back. <laughs> like, I know you're a podcaster. And I'm like, if there's somebody that's going to be like, I'm going to use my authority right now and turn yeah. it back around and be you. But I've had you, I've had you on the spot the whole time. What's the question again? Why is why there is something? It, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything? Why is there, why does anything exist? Why are we, what's going on? Oh, right? God. <sighs> Do you know what it is? This right, this might be totally off piste. Give it a shot. Because there is still hope. That's why. Yeah. Because without that, you know, we there is nothing. But yeah. but we still have hope. And whether that is, you know, for the pandemic to be over, for a better world, for a future for even on a micro level, you know, hope to, you know, have a holiday next year. Like that we, we still have that. Yeah. And, and that's it, why. Yeah. No, I, and, 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 and thank you because that point shouldn't be dismissed in the times that we're, <laughs> that, 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 that we're in. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm hopeful. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, so there's and, there's something. You no, know, there's always uh, something to be hopeful always, for as well. <laughs> there's, 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 there's always. You can keep your forty two. Yeah. Oh, hey, <laughs> I just you know I throw it out there. It came from it came from you know it came from uh, your area, so I figured. Yeah. I'd, you know, throw yeah. It out yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I want. I just want to op open up here at at the end. Um, uh, gosh, I mean, like obviously we could have talked you know, a whole bunch about like the particulars of mm. the material, um, you know, that, that you produce, there's a lot, we could do that, but I just wanted to like hand over the time to you. Um, I think your work is amazing. I Thank only you. because that that's a, a factual statement in my experience, but I want others to people to be able to, uh, experience it. So could you just mm. take the time you need to kind of say, Here's where you can find the things. This is what's going on. And I mentioned Zombie Mum, which I love. And, you know, tell us about, you know, where to find the stuff you're involved with. Sure. So you can find most things or the links to things on my website, which is just my full name, Hannah Walker Brown, Hannah spelled H A N A dot com. Um, there's links to kind of sound pieces through there. There's all the details about my book on there. There's also links to Broccoli, um, the production company that I'm creative director of on there, which is where Zombie Mum lives. Um, so that's probably your best port of call. And then off that, you can kind of explore. Um, I'm launching a blog on there at the end of this month. Although, when does this come out? This will be out in a couple of weeks. So, yes. Fine, yes, yeah. Yes. So yeah. probably like now-ish. Um, <laughs> just... To I wanted a space for my writing. Like, if you follow me on Insta, you follow me on Instagram. I like to write a lengthy caption, um, and I was like, "I'm not using this. This is a photo app. I'm going to go and write somewhere else." So I'll still, you know, direct you. There, You're used to yeah. writing now. You want to write? I just want to. You know, I've always wanted to write. That's the thing I wanted to do since I was a kid. So now I'm doing it. I just need to enjoy it a bit more, I think, and stop like putting yeah, insane pressure on myself but yeah my website hannahwalkerbrown.com is where you can find everything you might want to listen to or read or watch um yeah yeah and and and, and thanks and I, again i uh when 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 listeners go there they'll still see what's going on because um like i said uh, i i just wanted to to as, as you've been able to tell um I, I feel it a true honor uh, for you to spend time uh, on. Oh, it's on, a pleasure. So yeah, and um, you know, I, I, I honestly like the the nature of the conversation. Obviously, there's the personal interest of seeing how you your mind is like figuring and thinking about things, and um, I appreciate your openness to 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 make those comments and and you know, kind of like let us in mm. um, because you know. Uh, not everybody does that, right? You and I know that, and it's, it's yeah. not easy. It's not easy to do. So I wanted to thank you directly, and particularly, it's it is an honor for um, no, the that's show a and pleasure. You to have you. Yeah. And you know what it is, and I think this is something I've always thought about is it is easier if someone else goes first. 
you know, if I'm willing to open up, if I'm willing to be vulnerable, you know, by default, it also gives other people permission to as well. So I think it's important. And that's not to say everyone needs to go and, you know, <laughs> heart's bad, like this is how I'm feeling. But I do believe that, it, you know, courage, if I'm courageous, I just hope it would inspire someone else or, or show them that it's okay to be like that yeah. as well, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty hot on my sleeve if you get me going. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I just, and again, it makes it easier to, to make documentaries, to to be in that situation with other people if they can see that that's how you are as well. It's that permission. I think we're always looking for permission. We need to know that something is okay before we do it. And, and I hope that that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hannah, Hannah Walker. Pleasure. And uh, deep pleasure. And uh, gosh, I, I sure hope we get a chance to chat again soon. I've learned yeah, so much. Absolutely, yeah. This is Something Rather Than Nothing 